All right, Bible warfare, how to defend your faith, lesson 11, Garden of Eden and Noah's flood questions. So we're down to our last two lessons for this series where I'm trying to answer some of the questions concerning the Bible that were handed in. These are, of course, questions not only you, but others have asked throughout the years. And maybe you didn't have an answer to this question when someone asked it to you. Uh, these last questions don't fit into any one category, so we're just going to group them together as Old Testament questions, New Testament questions. So the first question is, uh, why did God forbid eating from the tree of knowledge of good and evil? Why did He do that? What was the point of all of that? Why didn't He just put them in the garden and just leave them there? I mean, everything is fine, everything is beautiful. He saw, he saw what He had created and He said, this is very good. I mean, why add the, the tree of knowledge of good? Why that commandment? Why, why put that there? So that's what's behind this question here. The answer is in Genesis chapter two, 16 and 17, let's read that. It says, the Lord God commanded the man saying, from, and notice he commanded the man, saying, from any tree of the garden you may eat freely, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat from it you will surely die. Um, notice, first of all, there's no mention of an apple here in all the popular movies in that. It's always the apple. There is no apple. It just mentions uh, fruit. Some of the reasons why God did this. First of all, um, the commandment established the context for the exercise of free will. We talked about this before. You cannot be human made in the image of God unless you can have free will. Otherwise, if you don't have free will, you're a robot or you're a plant or you're a rock or you're an animal, but you're not a human being made in the image of God. Why? Because God has free will. So God gave the co command in order to kickstart, if you wish, man's gift of free will. Humans have been created in such a way that they can discern good and evil and make moral choices. They have this ability, we have this ability. And so the command not to eat of the fruit provided the framework or the rules or the parameters or the law against which this ability of man could be exercised. In other words, you can't choose right from wrong if there's no choice to be made. If everything is right, you're not exercising your free will. And if you're not exercising your free will, you're not fully human. Another reason that God gave the command was to establish the order in creation. By establishing or giving the law or the rule or the prohibition, God was establishing His rulership over man. Why? Because the one who's in charge makes the rules. Right? We know this in a family. Is it the children that make the rules? Well, they, they like to think so, but not really, right? Woe to the parents and to the household where it is the children that make the rules. No, it's the parents that make the rules, right? So by establishing or giving the law or rule, God was establishing His rulership over man. Man would always know that God was superior because God was the one who made the rules. So the other reason why? To establish order. And thirdly, there may be more, I'll give you three. Um, this rule was established to show every generation of mankind after Adam that moral authority comes from God comes from God, essentially or originally, or the source of moral authority comes from God. I go back to my family analogy here. You know, sometimes you're telling children, you know, well, I don't want you to hang out with, the, with this person here. I'm not quite sure. You know, well, but why? Well, you know, I, uh, 
I don't, I don't like the look of it, uh, the way he talks to his parents, I'm not sure. You know, you're giving your child the, some of the reasons for that particular prohibition and they keep coming back, but why, but why? And then finally, what happens? What is it that you say? Because I said so. I mean, you, know, you, 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 you want to have some dialogue with your children, you, you want to give them reasons why you do things, but if they keep coming back with the why, it's no longer curiosity, it's a challenge. And in the end you say, well, because I say so. Well, what's behind that I say so? Well, I'm in charge, I'm the parent, I make the rules. You obey the rules. Well, in the same way, God makes the rules and we must obey the rules. His rules, however, were first and, and continue to be primary. With time, humans would create laws and rules, but these would always be secondary to God's laws. Isn't that the big debate we're having in our society today? What is it that we're saying? What has made, you know, make America great? Well, what has made America great? Because its constitution and its way of life originally was based on what? Well, it was based on God's laws, on principles given to God. You know, the rights that we have, uh, I hear uh, Christian or believing politicians always say, the rights that we have here in the United States are given to us by God, not the government. The government didn't give us the right to freedom. That's a, that's, a, that's a right given to us by God. And that's how America is different than from many nations that are not believing. Try to say, try to go to Russia and say, my right to freedom has been given to me by God. The next place you will find yourself will be in jail. <laughs> try, doing that in, uh, you know, try doing that in China or Pakistan, yeah, yeah, what makes America great at its source is that its ideology, its government, its laws have all been based as the source point, God's law. So exercising our free will is what animates us and it also demonstrates uh, to us uh, positive or negative consequences. All right, so there's one question, some, some possible answers to that particular question. Another question, again, Old Testament question. Why doesn't the Bible mention dinosaurs? For all you dinosaur fans out there. And it doesn't, I mean, it doesn't, you don't find the word dinosaur, you go to a concordance, you won't be able to find the word dinosaur. So the Bible doesn't use that particular word, but it does mention dinosaurs, but not with the words coined in modern science using you know, Latin or Greek word sources which were not available in the times when the book of Genesis was written. When the book of Genesis was written, Hebrew was the language. There was no Greek, okay? Um, so the modern word dinosaur comes from Greek words. Adenos, which means terrible, and soros, which means lizard, terrible lizard. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 21, the Bible refers to God creating great whales or great sea monsters. The Hebrew word here used is the word tannin, which is also translated elsewhere in the Old Testament as dragons. Isaiah, the prophet talks about Leviathan, the dragon of the sea, Isaiah 27, verse one. The Bible refers to animals in groups, okay? And so it uses the word tannin to refer to various animals in one group. And what animals fit into the group that the Bible refers to as tannin? Well, serpents, great lizards, monsters, sea monsters. And so dinosaurs would have fallen into this category as one of God's creatures, which like many others of that time are now extinct. We think today, oh, we have to stop the extinction of the beetle bug or something like that. And of course, you know, we don't want to destroy any animal needlessly. 
but that animals are becoming extinct is not something that has happened like in the 21st century. <laughs> animals becoming extinct you know, has been going on for thousands of years and it continues to do so today. You know, we say this often, it's worth repeating. Do I believe in climate change? Absolutely I believe in climate change. The climate started to change drastically after the great flood and will continue to change until the end of the world when God will destroy the earth and the heavens and the new heavens and earth will be established. So don't be afraid, to, you know, don't be afraid when they talk about climate change. Sure, of course the climate has been changing. It's been changing for thousands of years and it'll continue to do so. It's just we've put a, we've put a name to it and we've politicized it today. That's, that's what has happened. Okay, another Old Testament question. Where did Cain and Abel get their wives? You know, was this incest? First of all, the Bible only mentions Cain having a wife because his brother wasn't Abel. Sorry, that was a <laughs> bad, bad joke. I just couldn't resist. <laughs> Seriously, Cain did have a wife and he had children who intermarried within their own families. Of course, we, we wouldn't do that today. Maybe a fourth cousin or a fifth cousin. Some people explain this by saying that uh, the book of Genesis is only like, it's only a, a parable about creation. You know, Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel, it was only one family among many families where the eternal story of good and evil was played out and the story of sin and salvation are told. So the story in Genesis, some people say, is like a parable. You have to take it as a parable. It's just a story that explains the, the, the high points. All right? Well, this is all fine, very comforting. You know? um, uh, a very comforting explanation of the difficult parts of uh, Genesis because it's so logical and it's sensible and it's popular, especially it's not open to ridicule. Nobody will ridicule you if you say that. And it requires absolutely no faith to accept. The problem with this explanation is that it is not what the Bible teaches. That's the problem. The Bible teaches that the world was created in a total of seven days, and all of humanity began with one set of people, Adam and Eve. Let's just read that in case we're not sure. Now the man called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. Wait a minute, that doesn't sound like a parable. That's not a parable. That's detail. You know, it's one of the reasons, you know, the, I heard on the news that they, uh, the, the government spent, what, $220 million, a, a special uh, area of the Air Force that was looking for UFOs. <laughs> $220 million looking for UFOs. Some people say, well, how come you don't believe in extraterrestrials? You know, there are billions of stars and billions of planets. Surely there must be another planet. The law of averages says there's got to be a planet out there with living you know, human beings. And I respond, the reason I don't believe in extraterrestrials is because of Genesis 3.20. It says, he called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all the living. All the living. All the living created in the image of God. Could we find living matter on another planet? Sure. You can find some bugs or I don't know, some sort of amoeba, some, some, some of that. But you're not going to find living human beings made in the image of God. Why? Because it says right here that though that type of creature, a human being made in the image of God, all of those were produced through Eve. And last I heard, nobody took off from Earth to colonize another planet without us knowing it. I mean, I, I don't get into a huge debate about that, but if it was me, I wouldn't be spending a whole lot of money looking. I, I heard once a, there's a group that 
they have these huge uh, you know, radar things and they're listening, to the, they're listening to outer space and they're trying to get signals from other civilizations and they're listening all the time. And you know what it is they hear? Imagine that's your job, you, you're eight hours a day. Anyways. <laughs> I mean, sometimes it's just too funny. The world was populated from these original to the Bible teaches. Remember I said, the, I believe that the Bible teaches that the world was populated from these original two people and it was then repopulated after the great flood with only eight people, Noah and his family. All right, getting back to our, <clears throat> the question, so Cain then married one of his many siblings because this is how the world began to be populated. Um, before the flood, people lived for centuries. If you read, right, you find out so-and-so lived for 500 years, 800 years, 900 years. Okay? So they were able to have a great number of children who multiplied in ever widening circles as people moved further and further away from the original families. I mean, if Lise and I were able to have four children in five years, imagine if we lived for eight or nine hundred years, huh dear? <laughs> She's shaking her head, so. <laughs> I remember reading once someone who was taking all the genealogies and, and, and was calculating if, all they, if these people only had two or three children but they continued having them throughout these centuries, uh, it would have been easy mathematically to populate the world. Millions of people, okay? So it was, not the, it was not incest that someone married someone within their family because God commanded them to multiply and populate the earth. So it couldn't have been incest. It became incest only after the flood, when man's human nature was weakened by centuries of sinfulness and close marriages began to be a risk to society and to health. And so by the time of Moses, the law against intermarrying was finally established and codified. We read about that in Leviticus 18 verse 9, but until that time, and we even read about Bible characters marrying their cousins, their half-sister, and so on and so forth, there was no immorality attached to that. But eventually it became forbidden. And of course, of course we see this, uh, uh, we see this in, um, uh, in Genesis. How do you answer those who say that because they didn't experience death, Enoch and Elijah are the firstborn from the dead and not Jesus. So Enoch, who appears in Genesis chapter 5, verse 24, and Elijah, the prophet, who appears in the Old Testament, but he's referred to in Hebrews in the New Testament, these two did not see death. In other words, they didn't go have a heart attack and then the Bible said, and then they died and were buried. You know, like Aaron died and was buried. Moses died and was buried. Joseph died and was buried. You know, we, but these two, there's no mention of them dying, experiencing death. Some say that they, because of this, some say that they are the firstborn from the dead and not Jesus. Because they did not die, they were taken up to heaven. So how do you answer this? Again, you start from the Bible. Let's read, first of all, Genesis 5. It says, Enoch lived 65 years and became the father of Methuselah. And Methuselah, of course, in the Bible, is the oldest man who lived, recorded. Then Enoch walked with God 300 years after he became the father of Methuselah, and he had other sons and daughters. How many? Who knows? And he only lived 300 years. So all the days of Enoch were 365 years. Enoch walked with God and he was not, for God took him. So the Bible is saying here he was not. He was not here anymore. God took him to be in heaven. He didn't experience physical death. Let's read another passage in Hebrews 11.5. It says, by faith Enoch was taken up so that he would not see death and he was not found because God took him up. 
for he obtained the witness that before his being taken up, he was pleasing to God. So the Hebrew writer kind of clarifies and explains you know, what's written about Enoch back in Genesis. All right, then in 2 Kings, it says, as they were going along and talking, behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire, which separated the two of them. Elijah was walking with Elisha, his successor. And it says, and Elijah went up by a whirlwind to heaven. So that means Elijah did not experience death. He, while he was alive on earth, he was taken up to heaven. All right. So these are records of how these men were spared the agony of physical death and were brought directly to God without experiencing it. Okay, so now let's read. So people say, since they did not die and they, were, you know, they went straight to heaven, they're the firstborn. They should be the firstborn that the Bible talks about and not Jesus. Okay, so let's go to where they talk about that. And that's in Colossians chapter 1, verse 15 and 16. Here Paul is talking about Jesus. He says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. So that question challenges this here. How is Jesus the firstborn? Long before Him, Elijah and Enoch were taken up to heaven. Maybe they should be the firstborn. Okay? We continue in verse 16, it says, For by Him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible. What are the invisible things that were created? Well, the angels, of course. Whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through Him and for Him. He is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. He is also head of the body, the church, and He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that He Himself will come to have first place in everything. So in Colossians, Paul uses the term firstborn not to say that Jesus was the first one ever to be created, or the first one ever to be resurrected from the dead, this would be in contradiction to the Bible. I mean, as far as we know, angels were the first beings that were created. Angels were created before men were created. Satan's fall happened before man was created. So it means that angels were the first things, creatures, beings, that were created. And there's a whole history of angelic beings and what happened. You know, what happened? Satan you know, was displaced from his position. Uh, Jude said uh, he, he, he lost his position because he did, not, he did not remain in the position that God had put him in. And so therefore God sent him down. My own theory, and it's just my own theory, is that Satan uh, originally uh, you know, a beautiful angel refused to be the minister for men. In other words, the Bible says that angels are ministering spirits. Who do they minister to? Well, they minister to God in heaven by continually praising Him. Holy, holy, holy is God, right? And they also minister to men. And my theory is that uh, Satan or Lucifer refused to minister to beings that were lower than himself and for that reason God sent him down. But remember, that's just my theory, it's just my thinking, okay? You can come up with your own. So, um, uh, angels were the first to be created, okay? Uh, Enoch didn't see death and thus experienced a form of resurrection. We don't deny that. Paul uses the term firstborn to refer to Jesus' rank or his position in creation and in the church. Why do we know that? Because that's what he says in Colossians. Okay? Um, mankind was created. Mankind was not born. It says Jesus was the firstborn. It doesn't say Jesus was the first created. So mankind, they were, they were created and then after that they were born. The universe was created. It wasn't born. And so Jesus' divine nature gives him the first position, the first rank in creation. Why? Because of his power, his perfection, and of course because of his divinity. He has the first rank. 
In the same way, he is also the head or the first in rank in the church. Why? Because he's the firstborn into glory, into eternal life. Even if he wasn't the first one to go from earth to heaven. And the argument that this person, you know, this question is, is that, well, since Enoch was the first one to go from, from, uh, from earth to heaven, you know, he should be the firstborn. Or Elijah, he should be the firstborn. But remember, Elijah and Enoch, they only went from earth to heaven. Jesus went from heaven down to earth, and then he went back to heaven. That makes him the firstborn. He has a higher rank. Okay? Also note that the passages about Enoch and Elijah, as I say, they only say that they were taken up without seeing death, not that they themselves were glorified. Jesus is the first among those who are resurrected unto glory. All others, including these two, will follow Him into glory and eternal life. We even see Jesus' glorified body on the Mount of Transfiguration. He reveals, you know, you know, he's, he's, he's shining, the bright light. That's his glorified state. He kind of revealed that to uh, some of the um, apostles. Question, why aren't the apocryphal books included in the canon of the Bible? Um, how did they know which books to put in the Bible? There, I mean, there were a lot of books circulating you know, in the first century. I mean, there were a lot more than, you know, the books we have here, 27 books of the New Testament, there were a lot more books than that about Jesus. How come only these 27 made it into the official Bible? That's the question. So let's take the first one about the apocryphal books. The word apocrypha means hidden, comes from a Greek word, again, means hidden. It refers to a number of books written during the Old Testament period, but because of authorship or accuracy, they were not considered inspired works. They were nevertheless valuable for, the st for study purposes because they did provide historical and cultural information about biblical times and biblical people. Um, there were many such books produced and circulated, but in the 16th century, the Roman Catholic Church collected 12 of these you know, apocryphal books and they included them in the Catholic edition of the Bible. Now these 12 books had names like 1st uh, and 2nd Esdras or the Book of Tobit or the Epistle of Jeremiah or the four books of the Maccabees, the Maccabean period, uh, kind of a revolt period, an uprising in Judea between uh, the time of Malachi and the time of John the Baptist. There were 400 years there where no inspired works were, were, were given and we call that the intertestamentary time period. And during that time, there was a revolt among the Jews against, uh, you know, the, uh, the, uh, not the Romans, but the Greeks uh, and other uh, surrounding powers. And uh, so those books talk about that period of time. Fascinating because you really find out you know, the daily living style and some of the issues that were happening during that time that we don't have in, in, in the Bible, okay? Um, so for books to be considered, so that's the Apocrypha, that's what they are, that's how they got to be circulated. It started with the Catholic Church. One of the reasons they put these books in there is that a lot of the uh, rituals and a lot of the teachings that are in Catholicism find their basis in these books. Okay. Um, now, for books to be considered part of the biblical, what we call the canon, not like a canon, boom, not, not, not that kind of canon, the biblical canon, the term canon means a measure, so the books that measured up, all right? Uh, the books to be considered part of the biblical canon or official list of inspired writings, they had to fulfill certain qualifications, very quickly. First of all, they had to have been written by a chosen servant of God. They had to be proven to be written by a chosen servant of God, Moses, David, Solomon, or a prophet, Samuel, Isaiah, or in the New Testament, an apostle, Peter, Paul, or the disciple of an apostle, a person like Luke, for example, who was, an, who was a disciple of, uh, of Paul, or Mark, who writes the Gospel of Mark. Well, Mark was Peter's secretary. So when you're reading the Gospel of Mark, what you're reading is Peter's witness, except Mark is 
you know, is, uh, is writing it. So first criteria had to be written by a chosen servant of God. Secondly, it had to be recognized as inspired when originally circulated or spoken. So the book of Matthew was immediately recognized as inspired writing. Why? Because Matthew was, a, was an, an apostle. He had received the, the power of the Spirit. Uh, Jesus had promised to give him understanding and remembrance of everything that Jesus taught for the very purpose of you know, putting it in his record. Okay? Third criteria, it had to be recognized and well circulated in the nation or the church at the time of writing. It couldn't be an obscure little book that nobody ever heard of. You know, the, the books that became inspired were books that were already considered inspired and well circulated among the apostolic church in the first century. Everybody considered it, it was just a matter of formality to, to add that book onto the list. Okay? Um, it also had to withstand close scrutiny. Church leaders, church fathers, uh, the, 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 the scholars of the day studied these books and examined these books. They were looking for things that would demonstrate that they were not inspired in nature. Much different than, say, the Quran among uh, uh, Muslims. You, you're not allowed to criticize the Quran. You're not allowed to read it and criticize it. Say, hey, there's a mistake here. Well, this doesn't make any sense, or this contradicts this, or this here contradicts absolutely what history has taught. You're, you're, it's not permitted to do such a thing. Whereas the Bible began with criticism. That's why it's lasted uh, so long. Well, it's lasted so long because it's inspired, but uh, one of the criteria was uh, the very best minds uh, examined it. Uh, for its historical, theological, philosophical, whatever area it was in, it was uh, considered um, uh, inspired. Also, um, the book itself had to speak with divine authority and sincerity. Um, you, you don't find any of the books of the Bible, uh, a sentence from one of the New Testament writers who says, I think that, that, that never happens. <laughs> you go ahead and read through the New Testament. You'll never find anywhere in the New Testament where the writer says, I think that, or I feel that. You know, uh, what's his name? Uh, ben, uh, ben, ben, ben Shapiro, I love this, uh, he's a commentator. And he says, the facts don't care how you feel. <laughs> the facts, well it's the same thing. You know. The facts in the Bible you know, are not based on how you feel or what you think. They're based on what God says. So the uh, Old Testament canon or, or list of inspired books was collected and set by the first century, probably after the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. Uh, it was an effort by the Jews at the time to preserve their written history. So what we're reading, you know, what we're, when we read the Old Testament, what we're reading is what Jesus and the apostles were reading in the first century. All those books were collected in that way. The Jews uh, divided their material a little differently. They divided the Old Testament, well for them, the Holy Scriptures you know, was what we call the Old Testament. For them there was no New Testament. Right? So the, the, the sacred scriptures for them were divided into 22 books. We divide the same material into 39 books, but it is exactly the same, um, the same material. If you were to get a Jewish version of the, what we call the Old Testament and go through it, you'd see it was divided differently, but all the books are there. Okay. The New Testament canon, or list, it was collected and recorded and finally set in 367 AD. It was at this time that the 27 books were established as the inspired texts and they were added to the 39 Old Testament texts to form what we now have as the complete Bible. And ever since 367 AD, there have been no additions and no deletions. So what you're reading today, it may be more modern, you know, the package may be more modern, but the books that you are reading, the material you are reading are exactly the same thing as what they were reading back in the third century. Okay? Um, another question, random question, is the quote, living Bible a good translation? 
The original manuscripts uh, for the Bible <clears throat> were in Hebrew, Greek, and parts of it in Aramaic, which was a common language in the first century Palestine. At first, the translation from these original texts and languages were made into other languages so more people could read the Bible for themselves. Here's the thing we need to remember, however. You had the original manuscripts in Hebrew and Greek, and there are thousands of these, okay? Copies and fragments, there are thousands of these, most of which are in, the, I believe, the British Museum. Uh, so you had the original manuscripts, Hebrew and Greek. So someone says the first translation into another language, I believe, was into the Latin language. Uh, so what they did, the scholars studied the original manuscripts and they made the Latin translation. Later on, uh, let's say, I, I forget the order of the, lang the modern languages, but German, let's say they wanted to make a German. Well, they didn't go to the Latin version and, and translate it into German. They went back to the original Greek and Hebrew manuscripts and they translated that into German. And then uh, someone says, let's make an English translation. What did they do? They went back to the original manuscripts in Hebrew and Greek and they made an English translation. And then back to the original for a French. And always, that is always the thing. So the argument, people say, yeah, but you know, if you go from the original to the Latin and then the Latin to the German and the German to the French and the French to the English, you're bound to lose something. Well, yes, if that's the way you do it. But if you go back to the original manuscripts every time, you're going to get the same result. And Lisa and I, when we first began, became Christians, we, we used to kind of, we were new at reading the Bible. That was not something we did growing up. And we used to kind of test to make sure that our Bible said the same thing. So since we were both bilingual, we spoke both English and French, and we both read English and French, she would read in her French Bible, I would read in my English Bible. And we wanted a test. You know? I say, uh, read Acts 2.38, let's just see what it says in French. Repentez-vous que chacun de vous soit baptisé au nom de Jésus pour le pardon de vos péchés, vous recevra le don du Saint-Esprit. That's French. Okay, then I would, I say, okay, fine. And I understood French, I knew what she read. And I said, okay, I'll read to you in English what that passage says. Uh, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Well, lo and behold, huh, I get, you know, my English Bible said, in English said exactly the same thing as her French Bible said in French. And no matter what passage we looked at, it was always the same. And if I could speak German, it would be the same thing. If I could speak Mandarin, it would be the same thing. All the Bibles say the same thing. Why? Because they're all translated from the same original material. All right, uh, I've gone down here. Okay, versions. One other thing for the bell goes. Uh, uh, translation, that's a language. Okay, what Bible translation? Do you have a French translation, English? Tra okay, that's languages. Versions of the Bible are style of language. So versions are Bibles in the same language, but ones that have different style of language. For example, you have a Bible, the King James Bible. It uses Old English. It uses Elizabethan English as its style. How do we know it? You know, thee and thou, and you know, it uses Elizabeth, it's Shakespearean English. That's the style, why? Because it was translated into that English language style at the time. Uh, a modern English Bible, the New American Standard, for example, is the Bible that I use. Well, it uses modern English, no these, no thous. Um, the New International Version is what's called an easy reading Bible. Okay, it's easy to read. It's written in such a way, the emphasis is to make sure that it's easy to read. There's no awkward sentence structure. For example, the first version that came out of the you know, American Standard, just called the American Standard Bible, I have that one. You read that one, it is the most literal translation from the, from the Greek to, the, uh, to, to English. It's a literal translation. Well, but the sentences are very awkward. If you speak two languages and you try to, to, 
to translate you know, uh, French to English word per word, usually your English is going to be a little bit backwards. Okay? So they updated the American standard and they made the new American standard and made the English flow a little better. Then you have uh, the Living Bible. The Living Bible is conversational English. Okay? It's called a paraphrase Bible. Instead of translating the language, they translate the idea in their own words. All right? The reason I use New American Standard, it's a nice balance. It's a, it's a nice reading Bible, but it's also a good study Bible because it follows carefully the original version. So I'm almost done. Most versions are designed around how the Bible is to be used. Is it going to be used as a serious word study? Uh, is it for first time readers? Is it for someone who's going to be using it in order to preach? Most of these versions are exactly the same in meaning, only the style of language is changed. However, one word of caution. You need to be careful with versions that leave out certain books of the Bible or change the original intent and meaning of the original Greek and Hebrew. For example, versions that change God's name to Mother God, Uncle God, you know, they don't, you know, this idea of, of uh, eliminating any type of male reference, uh, that's changing the Bible. Okay. Uh, any reference to kings or slaves or killing so that the version will be politically correct for one group or another, yeah, that's not so good. Uh, another example, versions that eliminate teaching that homosexuality is a sin so as to not offend readers who happen to be gay. That also is not, you know. Uh, versions that change any passage that supports male spiritual leadership in the church, so it'll be more acceptable for those who promote you know, women's roles in the church. Again, uh, there should be no agenda in a version other than making it clear to understand. Remember the original text tells us not to change or add or subtract anything from God's word. Uh, next passage, Revelation 22, 18. I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues which are written in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his part from the tree of life and from the holy city which are written in this book. So a version is not accurate or authoritative if it presents different versions of God's teaching or commands. You can have different styles of language, but not different teachings or commands. We have another thing. Okay, just as, so that's the end of this particular lesson. We have one more lesson to go in the series. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>